record button, and here is the button that says we're live on Facebook. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hey, if uh, you remember Bruce Lee and you want to know what's been happening since he was on the scene, you're in good luck because I am here with Sifu Helena Kaliff, who Hi. is um, carrying on Bruce Lee's legacy. And we're going to talk all about that in today's Hangout with David Dorian Ross and friends. Um, so uh, for those of you uh, who are just joining, first of all, I want to say hello, welcome. Uh, you might also be watching this on the recorded version. And what's going to happen is that uh, Helene and I are going to hang out and chat a little bit and talk about stuff, uh, martial arts stuff and Bruce Lee stuff and whatever else stuff that comes up. Um, but you are invited to be part of this conversation. So if you're watching live, all you've got to do is um, type in your questions or your um, hellos. There we are. Look at that. I found it. Helena, we're on Facebook. We're famous. We are? We are famous. Awesome. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah, let me... Let me do that. Okay, this way, see, I can see the comments when they come in, and then I can feed them back to us. You look marvelous. I tell you, I tells you. So Helena and I met, um, is it just this year? It seems like years ago. Yeah, we met this year. We met this year. Uh, I was um, really lucky to be introduced to Helena through the director producer at the great courses we just did a program called martial arts for the mind and body and we were um, seeking out some additional experts to fill out the the guest instructors that we were having and he said i've got a friend who knows a friend you know how that conversation goes i know somebody who knows somebody and uh and sometimes whenever i hear that i'm like oh this is not going to be good right but it turned out to be awesome and I had a chance to, to meet Helena, who is uh, one of the chief instructors at American Dragon Kung Fu in Coral Springs, Florida. And uh, she is the creator uh, and co-creator of a number of different programs down there. And I'm going to tease all of that background out of her um, right now uh, for, uh, for everybody to get to know her. But already we've got a bunch of people who are here. Maureen is here uh, from Ohio. Hi, Maureen. Hi, Maureen. <laughs> Uh, Sue Carter, Sue, Sue Carter, Sue, uh, Susan uh, lives in Wales, but, and attends my classes, but where are you right now? You're in like Sri Lanka or something, uh, somewhere over the, uh, Dave Sullivan is in Montana. He says hello. Hello. Because they have a Helena in Montana, as you might know. Yes, Helena, Montana. <laughs> Never been there. It's on my bucket list though. It's on your bucket list. I must go to the city that bears my name. <laughs> right. Of course, I'd be like looking around a long time to find a city called David Dorian. It'd be, I, I just, I, be looking for a while, I'd I think. Be looking for a while. So anyway, that's how Helena and I met, and we had an awesome time. And if you want to go see like three seconds of Helena, go watch the preview on the Great Courses website for the new program, Martial Arts for Mind and Body. And she does this thing when they introduce her, and oh my God, you are so fast. Like you just like the, they did not speed up the camera. That's how fast Helena actually is with her hand techniques. She's she's a live wire. Right, so very excited. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. So um, here's how this uh, show goes. Uh, I ask her a question and then she asks me a question. And then if, hopefully if you guys have some questions, I'll ask one of your questions and we'll go round and around like that. So. My first question is, is about Bruce Lee and about your training in Jeet Kune Do. So like, give us, give us a little bit of the background for the, for the couple people who haven't met you before. As far as what I've done and- Like where did it start for you and, and, and then lead up to what you're doing now uh, at your school? Okay, well, it uh, started back in 1989, Queens, New York. Had a good friend of mine who We'd always go and hang out at her boyfriend's house and her boyfriend happened to be a martial artist. So we'd go to his house and I would see all the pictures of him and Dan and Asanto and all the instructors and his, his gear was everywhere, sticks and boxing equipment and all kinds of really cool stuff that mostly guys did at that time. I was just fascinated with it, always have been. Yeah, I was one of those kids who 
on Saturday afternoons. I don't know if they have it in Montana or in Wales, but the, <laughs> the drive-in theaters at Saturday afternoons at three o'clock where they have the Chinese movies that were dubbed. My father used to watch those all the time. I'd watch them with him and I was just fascinated by them. So I went to my girlfriend's boyfriend's house and one day I just looked at him. I said, what is all this martial arts stuff? This looks really cool. Tell me about it. And he gave me a little lesson in his living room and referred me to his school and his Sifu, which happened to be Sifu Neil Khalif. I went, I joined the school, uh, trained for a while, married him a few years later and moved to Florida. And that was back in 1989. It all started. And now we're down here in Florida. We have a successful school here. And that's really where we're at at the moment. That's, you notice, by the way, it did not escape me that you jumped right from, I started taking lessons and zip, then we were married and we moved to Florida. Oh. <laughs> that, <laughs> not quite that fast. It was, two, <laughs> it was like two seconds later, we were in very Florida. <laughs> no, there was a little time in between. <laughs> I mean, like, that's really like, you, I'm sure you guys who are watching know that like, that's where all the really juicy stuff is, is like, what's in that in-between stuff? Like, you know, so there were days when, you know, my girlfriends would say, your boyfriend gave you another black eye. Are you sure he's the right one for you? No, well, they didn't quite say that, but they did wonder why I wasn't going to hang out at the bar on Friday nights anymore because I had class Saturday morning and that was more passionate for me to be See? able to do that. So There you go. You find that passion. So tell me, not just me, you know, but for the people who are watching, like, you and I talked about this a little bit. We kind of tried to weave it into the show about remembering Bruce Lee, remembering him when he was alive and remembering like what that whole vibe was. I'm, I'm that old. I'm, you know, I'm you youngsters don't remember that far back. But, you know, I remember like the culture and what this whole disruptive Jeet Kune Do, not not traditional, but what is it? But it's really badass kind of stuff like Talk to me and talk to the, the audience about um, like what makes Jeet Kune Do special? Like what do we get? What's the legacy? Like this, this, this show is kind of like about Bruce Lee's legacy. That's where I want to jump off of anyway. It's about you, but I want to jump off with Bruce Lee's legacy. Well, Jeet Kune Do translates literally into way of the intercepting fist. It is a non-traditional method of martial art. So, Bruce Lee was a traditional Wing Chun practitioner, as most people who know Bruce Lee about Bruce Lee know that. He found that Wing Chun was a very effective martial art. There were certain elements that didn't work for everybody, worked for certain body styles, certain weights, certain height, but not for everybody. And he went out and decided to figure out what elements were missing and how he could put that all together. And he researched many, many different types of martial arts. And the thing about Jeet Kune Do is absorb what is useful reject what is useless and add what is specifically your own. So taking different elements from different martial arts and putting it into a system that could work for everybody based on their height, their weight, their speed, their power, male, female, child, adult, his Jeet Kune Do could be effective for anybody in the way that they use it. So my Jeet Kune Do will look different from yours. Your Jeet Kune Do will look different from, from somebody else's, but it is all still Jeet Kune Do. Does that make sense? It's a theory, a philosophy of training, not necessarily a traditional martial art. So this is, I think, a real interesting um, distinction about what is Jeet Kune Do from other, other kinds of martial arts, is that it is less about here is what a punch is, here is what a kick is, but rather a philosophy of the why and the when, necessarily, you know, uh, like you have to have some tools but it's not a, a structured, you know, only one way every, every time kind of. Correct. Kind of. Yes. What do you, you think that was what? Just adapt. Like I get even now that you've been training for, I, I, I can kind of try to picture you, you know, uh, at, in your 20s, like, like a little bit of a rebel, a little bit of a like, I can't imagine anybody ever telling Helena what to do I without you, you know without you going, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Pretty much. Right? I fit right in. I fit right in. When I joined, when I joined uh, Sifu Neal's school, I was the only female. 
for quite some time is all guys. And you had to have that attitude at, at that time. There was no women, really. Uh, very few women did martial arts and let alone any doing them professionally. So it was an interesting time when I, when I got involved. You ha almost had to have that kind of attitude to be successful with it. And so to it be seems like that, like that fits right in, like it, like it was made for, you know, that's sort of what could have hooked you in the beginning. Yes. Very cool. Yeah. Hey, so if you're just joining us, um, I want to say uh, thank you for joining us. We're talking with Helena Colliff, Sifu Helena Colliff from uh, American Dragon Kung Fu down in Coral Springs, Florida. She is a black belt. How many, like one black belt, 17 black belt? Like how many? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Our system doesn't really put much importance on that. Uh, black belt is fine. Black the, belt. The so she, are, yeah, the degrees don't really, after that level, it's not really important as far as the degrees. It's what you're learning and how you apply what you learn and so on. I, Continuing your training. You know me, I totally get that. I, um, I ask uh, a lot because people just like, they want to place it in context with what their concept of martial arts are. And by the way, the, this series of hangouts might actually change some of your concepts of what martial arts are. Like learning something from Sifu Helena today, I think, you know, might be a very interesting education in like where um, different styles emphasize their, their tradition and whatnot. Anyway, what I wanted to say is that you can be a part of this whole conversation that we're having here. I'm, I'm monitoring, this is why I keep looking down here. I'm not actually checking sports or something like that. I'm looking at uh, the comments that are coming in on Facebook. So all you gotta do is write in your question. If you would do this, put in all caps, question, and then write out whatever else. I'll know that it's a question and, and I'll feed it to uh, Sifu Helena about um, uh, what your question is and you can be a part of this conversation. So it's just not all about me. Uh, speaking of which, it's your turn to ask a question. Okay. So David Dorian, how old were you and what got you interested in martial arts? Ooh, how old was I? So relatively speaking to people who like, you know, were my contemporaries, I started when I was in my 20s and um, so that was relatively old because I immediately got into uh, the Chinese Kung Fu community where people were starting in like when they were eight. You know, like, when did you start? Like, my mom put me in class right, when I could walk. Right. So I felt like I was really old and had no, no background, none, zero. And had my closest association with, with uh, martial arts and Bruce Lee was that I used to work at a movie theater in high school. And we ran Enter the Dragon for like three months straight. So I'd seen that movie, oh, about 700 times. <laughs> so that was, and I still liked it. So that, uh, I was actually returning to college after being in the military and I wanted to learn to meditate. And I was so absolutely like terrible at trying to meditate that I got, it was suggested to me that moving meditation might be more my speed and that I should try Tai Chi or yoga. And so I tried them both. And I tried them the, like the same week. I did my first Tai Chi class on a Tuesday, my first yoga class on a Thursday. And I've been doing both ever since that was like 40 years ago. So that was how it started for me. And then I'm like, holy cow, it's Kung Fu, <laughs> you know? And so like then I got into a lot of stuff after that. But that began my journey. And it never stops. And it never stops. And now, you know, I'm, I'm 60, just turned 60 last summer. And Good for you. Don't and, look a day over 40. Uh, don't look a day over 40. You don't. It's, uh, See, it's I, the martial arts lifestyle. It is. It is totally. We were just talking about that this morning. Like, like we're going to rebrand our company. as like, It's not just about learning class, teaching class, or whatever. It's a lifestyle, right? Um, I say all the time, i got to make this body last another 60. So, That's right you got to treat it with respect. you got to treat it with love and whatnot. And the way you treat your body with love and respect is the way you treat other people and their bodies and their minds and their spirits. You treat it the same way because you are them and they are oh, you. I agree. Right. Cool. Absolutely. All right, so we've got some questions coming in here. Let me see if I can um, find them. 
Uh, Sue Carter, who is in Surabaya, by the way. She's visiting her daughter in Surabaya. Uh, she says she is female and very small, and she started in Aikido for the same reason. Where is she? Well, she's, she's my student in, who lives in Wales. And wow. she's on, uh, on, she's not actually on holiday. She's actually out visiting her daughter who lives in Surabaya. Which wow. That's some I'm, commitment. I think I'm supposed to know where that is, but I'm not sure I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't help you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. No. So I brought you on the show just for your geography knowledge. No, I did not do well on that one. <laughs> Uh, Steve Coffin's here. He says, I love the JKD approach to martial arts. Me um, too. So, okay, so here's the question that, I'm, that I'm, I'm clairvoyant and I can predict the future and the past. So I know you've been asked this question like 8 million times, maybe just in the last week. How does JKD compare to MMA? <laughs> That's a loaded question. I know, right? I set it up for you just like that. Well, see, here's the thing. MMA, as you know it today, is really a reflection of what Jeet Kune Do originally was or is. Um, back in the time where Bruce Lee was developing this method of training, it incorporated everything. It incorporated boxing and striking with the hands. It incorporated kicking, elbows, knee strikes. There were takedown sweeps and throws. There were finger locks, arm bars, locking on the ground, striking on the ground, grappling. It was all part of how Bruce Lee formulated this martial art. It was the original MMA, but it wasn't considered MMA at the time. It wasn't no such thing. So the MMA now that we're looking at, you'll see a lot of elements of that type of training because Jeet Kune Do has boxing. It has some Thai boxing element to it. It's got some karate kicking to it. It's got uh, Filipino Kali influence. It's got grappling influence. I mean, the elements of Jeet Kune Do is, is all of it. So how does it compare? I would say it's the original. And what we're seeing today has come from that uh, and just maybe tweaked a little bit here and there in different aspects, but the original is still, in my opinion, the strongest, depending on how you use it and what you use it for and what element you become strongest at. Okay, so those of you who out there who, I don't know if anybody who's watching right now that I'm recognizing, um, is like this, but, but some of you will be watching this who are total MMA geeks. Bruce Lee versus Conor McGregor. <laughs> are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to have to say Bruce Lee. Yeah? Yeah. So you just leave it there and not try? <laughs> it's not so much one better than the other. It's what tools are strongest in each person and how they use them one another. I feel Bruce Lee's speed, his skill, his timing, his distance, control of his distance was just far superior to anything that we have seen yet till this day. It's unfortunate he hasn't lived long enough for us to really see what he would have been capable of. But in my opinion, doesn't mean it's the truth. It's my opinion. It would be Bruce Lee. Be Bruce Lee. Well, you're the expert in the house today, so we'll go with that. That's awesome. I know, that was like a total loaded question. Um, Frank, who lives in Belgium, by the way, I know she's like, <laughs> Frank says, I see MMA as a heavy duty sport and JKD, oh, I see MMA as a heavy duty sport and JKD as real life. That's his comment on, on that. Um, Patricia Snodgrass says, Bruce Lee was a god. Um, well, there you go. See? There you go. <laughs> and Conor McGregor is a mere mortal. So that's cool. The rest of us are mere mortals. The rest of us are mere There really mortals. hasn't been anybody that's come close, if you have to admit. Even, you know, even the martial arts superstars that we have now, they're phenomenal. Great practitioners, great on screen uh, application. There's nobody quite like him though. And, and if you ask any of these people, they'll tell you the same thing. He was just that good. So it, it's you know, a mixture of a couple of things in, in the way that I, you know, you know me because we work together. So I'm a, I'm a bit of a historian about martial arts. And what, 
one of the things that sets him apart, in addition to his physical skills, is that he was just thinking about this a little ahead of everybody else. Like for a lot, of, when I in the back in the day when he was alive and I was following him, it was a lot ahead of where everybody else was thinking. But you give you know somebody like Bruce Lee who is an absolute genius in the first place, that much running room out in front of the thought processes. By the time you're thinking about, oh, you know, adapting to real life situations in this, you know, um, innovative way, now you're just catching up where he started and he's already out in front of you. Yeah, way ahead of him. Way ahead of him. Way ahead. Just the way that he thought about it is, um, is his advantage. W would have been would be still is, I mean, you know, time is time. Time is an illusion. So he's still here right now. <laughs> so it would be uh, his advantage. Yeah, way way ahead of his time. Just always twenty steps ahead of everybody else. And you know, he he was a philosophy major, so he had a lot of that to go with it. It just was a very powerful combination. Um, I'm still looking at the. Um, uh, the comments that are coming in on Facebook over there, first of all, thank you for the comments. We're getting an awful lot, Helena, just to let you know, saying hello and saying that they're enjoying the conversation. Patricia Snodgrass is also is still going on about how she has a crush on Bruce Lee. Just, just saying. <laughs> um, I get that. <laughs> and uh, and Ty, Cobb, Ty Cobb is is giving me a little bit of a razz about my time is an illusion. He says Bruce Lee is still dead. I I know. I'm just fantasizing that he, he would not be. Um, and I'm still uh, looking to see if you have some questions for Helena. Uh, you can write them in here. I will uh, feed them to her and we'll get her take on whatever your interest is in your questions. In the meantime... So I have a question for you. Yes, your turn. So obviously when I was working with you on the set for the video, you have an incredible ability to present and to speak and to get the point across. And you didn't really have much rehearsal time. How no. do you do that? <laughs> How do you do that as well as you do? You um, know, I mean, you did a lot of these things in one take. I was impressed. I thank you, first of all, for that. And, and like, for those of you who are uh, don't know how much so a lot of it is just practice. So we have a, a main thing in my school. Our, our number one training principle is you get best at what you practice most. You get worst at what you practice least. And so I've done over 150 DVDs and television episodes and whatnot. Like, that's a lot. I'm, I am by far and away the, the, as an individual, not as a, as a production company, but as an individual, I've done twice as many easily as any other individual that I know of, maybe in the world, but certainly in the U.S., around you know martial arts and Tai Chi in specific, and a lot of my stuff stinks. Like a lot of like I've made I made a lot of like you you watch my my very very first you know VHS instructional tape is so bad. I hope every copy is burned and like like nobody watches it. It's just it's so so terrible. But over time you know, the practice makes you better at being able to do whatever your craft is. And I love martial arts. I mean, it's really a passion for me. The, not just the physical activity, which I so totally am jazzed about every time I have a chance to train or whatever, but also the philosophy and the theory and the history. And so when I get up and I do like a one take, it's because it's already in there. It's bubbling up. It's like, it's like, a little voice, a little alien in my head says, dude, just open your mouth and <laughs> stuff will come out. <laughs> right? And so it's already in there just wanting to be let loose kind of thing. But thank you for the, for the compliment. It's I really just do. very eloquent the way you do that. Um, the other thing I think about this, and, and this is why I'm so impressed by all the guest instructors that we had on the show um, is each one of you is a really consummate teacher. So I'm a terrible student. Uh, I have what I say zero, zero goose egg talent for anything physical, martial arts and Tai Chi. I have zero talent for Tai Chi. So I had to work twice as hard, three times as hard to get any skill at it. 
And so a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm reverse engineering the difficulties that people who are not you know, naturally gifted at, at physical activities or martial arts in specific and try to teach in a way that makes it accessible. And that's what you do. That's, that's what you do and when you're on camera. You broke it down so beautifully and, and really laid it out there in such a way that I, I know everybody was like super, super impressed. We had, we had extras on set that we sort of put with the guest instructors to have them teach it mainly so that I didn't get all bruised. But, you know, so, and, and, but you, you like, you turn every one of them into a perfect sparring partner within minutes. That was you. Me? That was you, yes. That's why I say I'm so impressed by you and, and really the company of all the, the, the guest instructors, but like, I'm, like you are a fantastic instructor. You, you Thank did, you. You really did I that. I appreciate right. that. You know, I had, I had great instructors. My, my husband, Neil, Sifu Neil, um, trained, trained the crap out of me, let's put it that way, excuse the French, but you understand you're old school. Yes. So back in the day, the training wasn't, uh, we didn't have pads, we didn't have protect, as much protective gear. It was really just uh, gloves, a mouthpiece, and shin guards, and that was it. And you trained, if you, if you even had the shin guards on. Um, Sifu Neil really drilled into me the importance of getting it right and doing it a thousand times, two thousand times, three thousand. It was nothing for us to stand in front of the heavy bag and do a thousand high kicks on the bag in a training session because he wanted us to have that, not the memorization, but the ability to not have to think about it if we have to use it yep. to be part of who we are. Yep. Uh, and I thank him for that because especially being a girl, he wanted me to really be able to use it if I had to and understand what I'm doing, not just to memorize a routine or a form or memorize techniques to pass a test. It was drill this until it becomes part of who you are and what you do. And you know what? Whenever you're ready, we'll throw a test at you. It could be a year. It could be two years. It wasn't like it is now. A lot of times it's learn the material test, learn the material test. And that's very important for goal setting and for teaching a lot of people. But when I was coming through, that wasn't the case. It was, okay, I'll test you when I think you're ready to do it. And it could be, like I said, my first test, I think was about a year and three or four months into my training before I actually moved up a level. So um, that's why I think now I have that understanding and that ability to give that to mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, our school does use belts. Yes, we do have pro process of testing, but they only do that when they're ready. And so you have to kind of balance teaching the masses and giving them the real training and not making it about memorization test, memorization test. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard balance, but we're making it work. Yeah. I, making something it work. you said, I, I want to just kind of make a comment on it. Um, because you said that uh, Neil, uh, Sifu Neil, who's now your husband, um, after two seconds of training. Um, yeah, two seconds. <laughs> that <laughs> it feels that way sometimes. <laughs> right. You know, would, you know, would prepare you because you said, especially being a girl. And I, I want to maybe talk to a couple of people out there who are watching who may not be martial artists or may not have, like, you make a statement like this in, in, in this sport. This is such an arbitrary designation. Like you're a girl, you're a guy. You're a girl in martial arts, you're a guy in martial arts. Toughness knows no gender. And Great. Sifu Helena is tough. She's obviously got you know, her sweetness and her heart in there, but she's a tough martial artist. Like I don't care if she's a girl. If she hit me, it would hurt. <laughs> A lot, you, you know, like, like, and, and if she was called upon to use in whatever context the martial art that she has studied, her toughness would dominate anybody who, you know, tried to test her. And that is a lesson about everybody, that toughness knows no gender, toughness knows no age, like being 60, 70, 80, 90, doesn't matter. You could start when you're 90 and be tough, right? That's just, that's something that you choose and you train and you become. Right? And I that's, agree. Mental toughness first, physical toughness follows.
So Patricia has a question, and um, since uh, she followed the, the rules <laughs> and wrote a question, um, and this would be a, a really good uh, segue for you. She says, do you have, oh, she's got two questions. Holy cow. All right, so. Yes. Um, So her first question was, do you have a, a, a website for the studio? We do, uh, Patricia. Hi, Patricia. The website right now is under construction, but you can go to americandragon.net, and that'll give you a little bit of an idea of, of what we do uh, and who we are. We're actually changing that over shortly, but if you keep looking, you'll see that change come out about, I don't know, so two or three months from now. Okay, I just typed that in for you guys. So americandragon.net, you can go ahead and click on that and go over to their current website. And then just like, uh, do you have um, like a sign up for a newsletter or anything like that? On there? I don't yet, but that's coming when we make the change okay. over to the new, to so, the new web page. Yeah, that'll be available for sure. And do you have a Facebook page? Yes, American Dragon Martial Arts Academy. American Dragon Martial Arts Academy. Again, let me just type this in. American, is it Dragon Singular? Yes. That's what Dragon I thought. Dragon Singular. American Dragon Martial Arts. Academy. In Coral Springs, Florida. So there, there's a few, I think, on, on Facebook. There's the name of the school. And if you search for this on Facebook here, you can find her Facebook page. Okay, so um, Patricia's second question was gonna is a great lead in to something that I know that, that you're very involved in, and that's self defense for women. Now yes. you've developed a special program around self defense for women, haven't you? Uh, I was part of it, yes, uh, developing that. It's a uh, self-defense system for women uh, specifically. And what's it called? What's it what's called? That? It's a part of the escape to gain safety process. Say that again slower for escape old people like me. to gain safety. Escape to gain safety. All right, so now I'm going to shut up and let you tell me all about it. Well, you know, the way, the way we do um, our self-defense classes is... You know, we gather the ladies, they come in, and the object for us is to really, it sounds cliche, but when you say empower women, it's more to make them aware mm -hmm. and confident within themselves so that they feel empowered uh, to not be a victim. How to, believe it or not, a lot of women don't understand that the way they present themselves, the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they hold themselves, either shouts victim or it shouts, don't mess with me. So the first thing we go over is how they stand, how they talk, how they walk. What are they doing when they're walking? Are they distracted? Are they doing this? Are there other things happening? Are they with their children? Are they not with their children? There are different ways you would do things if you have your kids with you as opposed to not having your kids with you. Ways you can protect yourself using everyday things you keep in your purse. Hmm. Uh, ways to be aware. What to do if you have your children present. What not to do if you have your children present. So that we go through a lot. Um, we usually do it in about two hours for the initial class, and then we have a four-week program that we really delve into the training. We also teach them some physical self-defense as well. Awesome. This is, and you do this uh, only at your studio, or do you travel around the country and do these? We don't really travel around the country. We pretty much do it local. I mean, I would go to other places to do it, but it really hasn't been something we... So if somebody sent you an email and said, hey, can you come to Minnesota and do an Escape to Gain Safety seminar, you would do it? Sure. If they, if they paid you. <laughs> yeah, I would, well, at least, yeah, that, at least that, their fair and stuff like that, sure. And it depends <laughs> on the time of year, too. You say Minnesota? Yeah, I said, I just pulled that out of my yeah. ear, yeah. It'd have to be like July or August to go up there, yes. <laughs> you ever been to Minnesota in the winter? I have, as a matter of fact, oh. yes. <laughs> so uh, you hear that, all those of you Minnesotans, if uh, you wanted to come, it's got to be summertime. I tell you what, God bless those people. It's cold. Um, Dave Sullivan has a, um, a technical question about uh, JKD. So he says, having followed Bruce Lee since before his death, I've not heard much about him regarding using Tin Ma, which some use in Tai Chi. Did he use it? And do you or current JK Do schools include it? Well, I'm sorry, what's his name? Dave Sullivan. Hi, Dave. Thanks for the question. Uh, well, first, they have to understand Ji Kundo schools are just as different as Ji Kundo itself is. Every school focuses on a different aspect of 
the training. Some schools go more into the grappling, some schools are more into the boxing, kickboxing, some are more into the trapping and the, and the grappling takedowns area. Um, every school does all the areas, but some have more specialties. So as far as the China, uh, from my understanding, yes, he did use it. And yes, we do, but not a lot. Our program, it's, it's minimal, but it is in there. Um, some schools you might find do that a little bit more, but it's definitely part of the lineage and part of the process of Jeet Kune Do. Does so, that answer your question? I think, yeah. That, so, um, Chin Na, and I, again, the people who are uh, um, jiu-jitsu uh, practitioners will always get upset with me when I say this, but Chin Na is considered by, by many in Chinese martial arts to be the forefather of jiu-jitsu and that kind of grappling those kinds of grappling arts, um, would it be a little bit more of a, a common uh, element in JKD schools to say we do a lot of jujitsu in, in JKD? No. No. I, 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 for our school, I would say no. Uh, other schools, other Jikundo schools, you'll see a lot of the jujitsu element taught in there. So again, um, Jikundo, again, absorb what is useful. Reject what is used that an ad is specifically your own. So some people take that jujitsu element and put it into their jikundo schools, and it works beautifully for them. Uh, so I know it, it's kind of you don't really get a straight answer on all that because there really isn't one. Mm -hmm. um, for our school, we do. It's just not quite as prominent uh, as the trapping element and the kicking and the striking element that we use. Our strength is lies in that aspect of it. Got it. Cool. I got another question for you from Paula. Um, Paula says, "I have been practicing Eagle Claw Kung Fu since 1989. Uh, with it is also Tai Chi Qigong meditation." Oh, in her, uh, I see what her question is. So that there is this internal aspect to her Eagle Claw um, training with meditation and Qigong. Is there? an internal aspect of JKD? Uh, that's a really Great interesting question. question. Yeah. Great question, Paula. Yeah, it's, you know, people, it's hard to have people who don't train understand internal and external martial art. Um, in internal martial art, coming from the inside, from the energy, being able to center and root yourself. Uh, tai Chi, I, I would say, would be an internal martial art, yes? Yeah. Uh, Qigong, yes. Eagle Claw. Uh, there is an element uh, in the Jeet Kune Do, it's not it's so much through the meditation aspect, but more of the, when you learn how to strike, how to move, when you hit, it's got to come from the, the end, you got to root yourself and turn and use your whole body, your entire body in every movement. And it, it definitely, I would say, has a strong internal element. When you're learning in the beginning, not so much. You're learning how to hit, how to kick, how to trap. But as you grow in your Jeet Kune Do and in your expression of it, the internal aspect of it is is incredibly uh, important, and it starts to come out as you learn. And Filipino Kali as well. It's a mm -hmm. it's another art that that we train. The Filipino Kali is very much an internal martial art. So that's part of our Jeet Kune Do process too. So yeah, I would say most Jeet Kune Do schools will have some of that element involved. Do you, but do you teach or? make a part of your training meditation specifically? No, we do not. So that's, no, that, that's a very interesting like, thought process. You know, because uh, we, we know Bruce, um, Bruce meditated, and that was a big part of his life. Um, I had that t-shirt with Bruce meditating on it, and I gave it to Kathy. So I, every so often oh, did I, go, you? <laughs> I go to my drawer, and I'm like, I want to wear that t-shirt. Kathy, like, oh, if you're watching, yeah. I think he wants it back. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, boy. Oh boy. Doesn't want to come, come looking for me. Uh, all right, one more question from the group and then it's your turn. Um, Steve Coffin, Steve is another one of my students. Uh, Steve says, I think I read an article on escape to gain safety. Was the striking based around eye, throat, groin, and shin? Yes. Yes. There you go, Steve. Um, which is just a good idea anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, again, Jeet Kune Do, most efficient, direct, efficient line, right? So right. how can you get there the fastest, the most direct way, and what's the best target to hit? And so those are the down the center line. I'm going to turn the, the question over to Helena here for in just a second. But I, I just like, I have to ask these questions or make this comment, or otherwise I'll forget it. 
you know, that's, that's where my brain is at. So um, in terms of direct line, so I'm, I, I have like two days worth of training with Helena. I can't say that we've trained together in Sparta. Like it was on set and it was very controlled. But I'll tell you that I could see so much going on. So Helena is extremely um, precise. Like when you talk about direct attacks, you know, like she picks up a target, uh, eyes, throat, groin, you know, whatever, she'll go right there. But in addition to that, she is wicked fast. Like this is, this is just really something that, um, you know, you can tell the thousands of repetitions that have come from that to, to have that kind of, of speed. Uh, and, and you guys don't know this because, you know, you're getting a chance to watch her sitting at the table on interview and whatnot. But um, check out her website. Check out the website that's coming. You know, hopefully we'll, we'll see some, some video of uh, her classes in, in action. Like, this is what I'm... One aspect that's so impressive when you watch a martial artist and you go, that's just thousands of hours. End of story. That's, that's just thousands of hours. That's, that's all thousands. it is. You know, yeah. we have a saying that we teach our juniors. So what's the difference between a black belt and a white belt? Well, black belt is just the white belt that never quit. There you go. And did it over and over and over again. That's all it is. Yeah. That's all it is. There's no mystery to it. It's just training. Yeah. John Wooden, the basketball coach from UCLA, used to say, you know, champions never lose. They just run out of time. Right? That's it. The clock runs out, but they never actually lose because they just keep on playing. All right, your turn. My turn. What do you enjoy teaching the most? Ooh, that's a really good question. Because um, I know you're very versed in, in many different styles and, and different things. So um, what do you enjoy teaching the most? I enjoy most first day of a new Tai Chi class. And, and you know, I've taught, um, you know, I've been a trainer for competitive athletes, you know, who went on, to, I've, you know, run my own schools. We've had obviously everything, you know, intermediate advanced and everything. I still love, most of all, the beginning, beginning class. It's just always my favorite. Now, I don't, I'm not talking about kids either. Like, people who train kids, oh my God, I have so much respect for people who train kids, that's too much for me. <laughs> so I'm talking about adults, and oftentimes they're older adults. And what's happening now in my life is I'm running into older adults who are like almost on their last desperation move. Like, hey, I don't think I can do anything else, or I'm starting so late in the game because I, you know, worked at a job and never was a, you know, martial arts, whatever. Like. And to be able to, to introduce something and say, it's never too late. You can start right now. And that you, you know, I don't care how uncoordinated or, or non-physical that you feel, you know, there, you can, you, you can, you can. And that first class, always, I always get that, that feeling from the, from the group. And so that's why, that's still, that's a really good question, Leda. That's still my favorite thing to do is to teach beginners. That's that's great. I mean, it is. It's very true. You know, people can start at any age. They don't realize that you're never too old to start. You're really, never too old to start. Did I, and people get this in their head. Did I tell you this uh, when we were on set? I don't like uh, back in the late '80s. Um, I had a buddy, my my roommate, and I. We were training at the San Francisco Wushu team. And we like watched every kung fu movie there was, including all the Bruce Lee movies, all the the Bruce. L.I., you know, Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee. <laughs> Bruce Lee. So uh, there's this one movie, like, like one of the first ones uh, supposedly about his life, the biography movie, and there's this one line in the movie that was our favorite line, and we always would like say it to each other all the time. So the, the scene is um, the Bruce Lee character uh, saves his boss from being beat up by a bunch of guys who are trying to shake him down for money. And, he's, and the guy says, oh, Bruce, you're so great. And he says, you should, you should learn Kung Fu. And he says, oh, but I'm too old. And Bruce Lee turns to him and says, oh, but it's never too late. And that, like, that's been my motto forever. Like, that one line of the movie, so the Bruce Lee, it's never too late. It's never too late. I've had, we've had people in their mid to late 50s pushing 60 getting black belts. 
Never too late. Never too it's late. It's up here. There you go. Uh, let me just check and see if there... Um, Walter Santelli says, I'm sorry I missed the beginning, but is Sifu Helena part of your latest Great Courses production? Yes, she is. She is one of the fantastic, fantastic guest instructors. And she came on to do um, the segment on Jeet Kune Do. I just, I could not imagine a program about martial arts in America without JKD. But you know what? That's not all that Sifu Helena has trained in. And maybe this is an opportunity for me to ask her to tell us a little bit more about some of the other training that you've done. So you're a black belt in more than one thing. I am. And thank you very much, by the way, for all the wonderful compliments. Thank you. I, before I actually started Jeet Kune Do, I did some very informal Wing Chun training with a friend out in Long Beach in New York. Uh, but it was just a couple things for fun, you know, nothing serious. And my real serious training started uh, with Sifu Neil in the Jeet Kune Do. I also have extensive training and certifications in Filipino Kali. Uh, did tournaments, uh, all kinds of training as, as we went through. Muay Thai, I'm also an instructor in uh, Muay Thai from Ajahn Chai Sirisut in the USA Thai Boxing Association. I hold the silver glove in French Shabbat kickboxing under Professor Salam Asli. As now, well. where did you, I'm curious about this. This is like the most fascinating part. For, like, where did you get that training? Sabat? Yes. Uh, Professor Salem and my husband Sifu Neil are very good friends. Uh, Sifu, he would bring Professor Salem into the academy up in New York once a year for seminars. Ah. So that's how I met him and I started training through seminars. And then uh, when we moved down here to Florida, we would bring him in not only for seminars, but for private training as well. Uh, my girlfriend uh, and training partner Sharon and I would train with the, the professor and just fell in love with it and went all the way up to the silver glove level. So I was really um, lucky and blessed enough to have him in Sifu's life to be able to, to give us that training. One Can on you one. describe, so for people who don't know what this is or who have had limited ex, limited exposure to Sabat, can, can you talk a little bit about it as a martial art and where it comes from and what the sort of the style is like? Yeah, Ma, Sabat actually came from a, a martial art from France called Box Franche. Uh, it was actually French foot fighting. They would use their kicks and they would wear these uh, special shoes with a hardened toe. Ooh. Very pointy, hardened toe. Sounds deadly. Uh, and that's how it was a street self-defense art is really what it was. Uh, solely for, for street self-defense back in, in, the, in the days, I think it was the 17 or 1800s. And it evolved into uh, what we call sabat, which means old shoe. I oh, think. really? Old, yeah. Yeah, that's what and my kids call me, actually. The old shoe, right? Old shoe. <laughs> it's evolved into a very uh, intense sport. And if you Google it and you, you go to YouTube, there's all kinds of uh, Sabat fights that you can see. It's just tremendous. It's very fast paced, uh, cardio intensive. Um, it's brutal. Wow. Not quite like Muay Thai brutal in a different sense. It's fast. It's accurate. It's the control that you need to, to, to train is just unbelievable. Balance, coordination, movement. It, it's, it's fascinating to watch. If you haven't ever looked it up, you should look it up. And it's French, which means that... And it's while French. You, and, I'm sorry? When you get kicked in the head, it's just really romantic. It's, uh, Correct. Right. <laughs> you can't. And it's a lot of fun. It really is. Very cool. It really is. So um, we are getting to the end of our time here. I promised uh, Sifu Helena that I would try to get her out of here before an hour. Um, I see that still a lot of people and a lot of people have joined us. So first of all, for those of you who are joining us or watching on the replay, thank you so much. Um, I, ha I should have said this an hour ago, but you can always hit the share button down there. I mean, I, I think I see all of these um, wonderful likes and hearts and stuff that we've been getting from people. So thank you for that, um, because Sifu Helena really deserves all that because she is so awesome. But if you want to hit the share button, that way other people will be able to watch this uh, interview as well. And maybe they'll find out something that they've always been interested in. We still have a couple of minutes, though, if you have a question. Please go down in the bottom, type in all caps, QUESTION, so that I'll know that, <laughs> what to read, and then I'll feed that back to Sifu Elena. Um, and I've got just a couple minutes to do that. Uh, she's got one more chance at asking me a question, and then we're going to head on out of here. One more, huh? One more. One it's last question. Yes, until we all get together for drinks in Florida. 
Oh, please. Anytime. Anytime. The weather here is gorgeous right now this time of year. Oh. It's perfect. So, okay, here's my question. I'm not sure I know the answer to this, so it's going to be a question. Have you traveled anywhere in the anywhere else in the world for your own personal training? Well, I went to China uh, quite often. Um, so that was... Um, in terms of outside the U.S., where I have gotten a lot of my training, and um, you know, it sounds very romantic and it sounds very like uh, legit, like to say I went to China for kung fu or tai chi, or I went to Japan for, you know, um, karate or aikido or something like that. the The truth of the matter is, I mean, on the one hand the opportunity to train with some of these masters in China was like a once in a lifetime, like, like historic. Like I, I had, because of the fact that I was on the US team and had known some really famous people inside of Chinese martial arts in, in China, I got access to better coaches and teachers. And that, that was amazing. Um, and so without question, I got some high, high level training. Some, I'm sure a lot of it was just wasted on me. <laughs> like, cause, you know, I'm just, I struggle. But here's the thing that I say, like, in, in one sense, I could have re re replicated much of that training here in the US. And, and there were lots of great teachers that I studied with here in the States as well. But what was different was what I call the flavor. Like being immersed in the country of origin and doing my Tai Chi in China, surrounded by all the other students and by the teacher and by the language and by the food and by the smell in the air and by everything else like that, you, you pick up this flavor. Like one of the greatest compliments I ever got, for me it was the greatest compliment, is that um, when I lived in Hawaii and was teaching in Hawaii, uh, a, a master from China came and was visiting and he stopped at the park and watched my class. And he just stood there for like an hour watching class and afterwards he went over and you know shook his hand and thanked him for coming he said your student looked just like a chinese people and i'm like that's wow. the, that's the best compliment that is right people that's a high compliment high it's compliment. rare so that that was what i feel like the the really most treasured part of my travel overseas to study um, very cool yeah very cool all right, let me just check and see if there's uh, one last question here. And the winner is Steve Coffin, who says, how much is Wing Chun still a component of JKD training? He says, I enjoyed Wing Chun when I trained a few years back. Steve is one of my students up in Canada, uh, who's a wonderful artist, by the way. And maybe Steve could like do a little cartoon of Helena. Like, this is what I'd like to see. Steve, Helena and I as Rock'em Sock'em robots. <laughs> And here's Helena I love it. knocking That'd my block off. That'd be know. great. I'm going to put him on the spot. but. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, excellent question. The answer is, it is the foundation. It is still the foundation of the Jeet Kune Do training. That was Bruce Lee's mother art. That's what he started with. And everything that we do now is based off of what he learned uh, in that system. It's very much, we still do the Mukjong training. Uh, the wooden dummy training for those who don't know what a mukjong is. Um, we still do the trapping hands, uh, the hand immobilizations, all of that. And that definitely stems from the Wing Chun. It is still the foundation of what we're doing uh, in the Jeet Kune Do and that part of the Jeet Kune Do training. Awesome. Well, Helena, uh, Sifu Helena Kaliff, thank you so much. Thank for you for having me. So, so generous with your time. Um, if any of you happen to be living in the Florida area or want to travel through or, you know, on your way and you pass by Coral Springs, you owe it to yourself to come and visit her. I might send her an email first, just, just saying, um, to let her know that you're coming. Uh, look, Everybody's welcome. Look for her mm -hmm. new website coming soon and um, everything else. So have, you, have you got any other projects? Like, like So, A... You should all go out and get a copy of the uh, Martial Arts for Mind and Body uh, DVD set that just came out. Uh, she has her own, we got three episodes out of you, didn't we? Two or three? I believe so. Yeah, we got three half hour episodes where Sifu Helena is, is explaining Jeet Kune Do and the Jeet Kune Do method 
and, and teaching actual techniques. Um, if you're gonna, <laughs> I gotta do the disclaimer. If you're gonna do this with a partner, you need to be really gentle, like 10% effort until you're with an actual live teacher. But you could still learn an amazing amount by watching what Sifu Lena has, has got to lay down for us. So go and get that. And, uh, and maybe we'll get her back on the show again where we'll just, we'll, we'll get her into the studio with a camera and we'll just watch her take a bag apart or something. <laughs> I would have so much fun coming back. Andy, I would love to anytime. I had a blast. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much. Thank for you, For all of you guys who are watching, thank you again for the opportunity to share this with you, sharing um, some really great friends uh, that I've had a chance to meet over the years. And Sifu Lena is one of my newer friends, but I just love her very, very much, and she's really awesome. Thank for you. all of you guys, be well, be wise, be wonderful, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. Ciao. And the streaming.